Hello, and welcome to my YouTube revision for Evelyn Waugh's A Handful of Dust. This video is going to be looking at the death of John Andrew, and the way in which Waugh uses this as a significant feature in the text. The first thing that it's important to remember is that the death of John Andrew takes place in a chapter called Hard Cheese on Tony. And I think that the juxtaposition of the death of John Andrew against the title that War gives it certainly highlights the cruelty of which War is often criticised in his writing and taking delight in the cruelty of his, on his characters. It's interesting to see that actually this death actually becomes just part of a wider issue for Tony that alongside the betrayal of his wife, alongside the loneliness, alongside the sense that all of his friends are abandoning him, the death of his child is really just put as another one of these problems, as if actually the death of John Andrew isn't in itself all that significant. And in fact, if we look at the reaction of the characters to the death of John Andrew, we don't necessarily feel that this death is viewed as a cataclysm for the society. It is nobody's fault and indeed by not being anybody's fault it almost feels as if therefore it is okay. Nobody can be actually blamed for it. And I'd encourage you to remember how far this echoes the very opening few lines of this novel whereby we don't actually know whether two serving maids have been beheaded in an accident that has taken part at the very opening. The casual cruelty of Mrs Beaver and the way in which she doesn't seem particularly concerned about the well-being of those characters does seem to foreshadow for us the casual dealing with the death of a child that seems to take place. We must never forget that the novel never really moves past this moment for, for, for Tony, that as soon as his son dies, he no longer has an heir for Hetton. And if we're looking at Tony as being somebody that is trying to embody a particular way of life, the fact that he no longer has anybody to pass this way of life onto is, is surely very significant. And again, we must look at his surname, Last. Are we looking at him being Tony Last, as in he is somebody that will survive, he is somebody that will last, he is somebody that will be able to embody a certain set of characteristics? Or do we not rather see him as the last of his kind? And in those ways, the death of the son, the death of the heir, most surely embodies that he becomes the last of his fellows. I think what's the most significant thing about the death of John Andrew is that War has been at pains to foreshadow this death for us in pretty clear terms. We've seen him fall off his horse and get back up again. Nobody was particularly concerned. We've seen him talk about the fact that his horse has killed other people, which again is treated with great satire and great humour by War, but in light of the fact that John Andrew actually dies can be seen as being actually quite sinister. And we've also seen things like when Beaver tells Brenda's fortune early on in the novel and notes that there's going to be a sudden death which will cause great pleasure and profit. Now, when we spoke about this in class, we thought that um, Beaver was sort of alluding to the death of Tony in quite a, quite, a, quite a gauche way. But actually, if you look at the reaction of Brenda to the death of John, that actually she isn't devastated and we'll talk about this later on but actually she's quite pleased that it isn't her John, John Beaver that has been killed. It feels that actually this isn't a significant event for her. Perhaps pleasure is particularly harsh but she certainly anticipates profit from this death that she sees this as the cataclysm and the, sorry, the catalyst for being able to divorce Tony and this death therefore does actually cause great profit. However We've also seen very specific moments where the, the death of John has been, been foreshadowed. Uh, Tony writes a letter to Brenda where he makes the joke that he hopes John Andrew doesn't break his neck in the, in the hunt. And we've also seen where Nanny has said that John won't actually see any death at this hunt, that he won't, when he notes that he wants to be in at the death, um, Nanny points out that he won't see any at all. 
that in itself seems to chillingly foreshadow it. And even when the hunt is going on, Ben talks to him about taking him home and John says there won't be another day the world may come to an end and the fact that his world actually does come to an end in a few minutes later does seem again to be quite unpleasant in the in the way that war has treated this I guess what I'm trying to point out here is that we are not surprised by the death of John Andrew and if we're not surprised by it because it has been so clearly foreshadowed for us can we really be affected by it? Is war trying to stop us feeling shocked by it, by so thoroughly investing in, in foreshadowing? It's hard not to read Brenda's reaction on learning of the death of John Andrew without being horrified. The notion that she is happier to learn that her son has died rather than her lover is extremely difficult for us to deal with and I think this is probably the key moment where as an audience we begin to find it absolutely impossible to sympathize with her character even if we find ourselves feeling that there is some justification in her decision to move away from Tony. However we shouldn't be too shocked at this behavior because quite clearly she's been choosing John Beaver over John Andrew for the majority of the novel we only just have to look at how little time she's been spending at Hetton compared to London. We need to just see how uninterested she is really in the existence of her son to realise that she is a non-maternal figure. We may want to suggest that perhaps War is suggesting that this is the way forward for female figures to move away from Contrary Patmore's angel in the house that stays at home and looks after the children at all times. However, she is such a dislikable character that it is difficult to believe that War is truly suggesting that Brenda's view of motherhood is the way forward for civilization. I would much rather choose to suggest that in the world of fairly admirable female figures, Bear Beaver is by, yeah, sorry, Mrs. Um, Brenda is by far the least attractive of these. It's interesting to note that the death of John Andrew actually has many parallels to the death at the very end of The Great Gatsby, where the motor car causes the death. If we look at what's taking place at Hetton at the time of John Andrew's demise, we see that we have a traditional English pursuit, the fox hunt, the journey across the, the countryside in a very traditional way, and that's juxtaposed against the many vehicles that seem to be part of the hunt on this day. We see the van, we see the coach, we see the bus and obviously most tragically we see the motorcycle. And we may choose to believe that actually what war is focusing on here is not that John Andrew's death is caused by the inattention of his parents or the fact that he is too involved in countryside life but rather that his death is caused almost directly by the behaviour of those Londonites, those that have brought the materials in from London that have got no place in Hetton, and that the death is caused by the advance of progress. So the ending of John Andrew last as the last of the lasts in Hetton is actually hastened by the advance of technology. Tony will be forced out of Hetton because he is unable to deal with the advance of technology which entirely symbolically has killed his son. But finally we must really question what is lost in this novel with the death of John Andrew. Obviously much humour, much affection and also perhaps one of the most truthful characters that we see across the text. If we look at a character that is able to bridge the gap between what will happen at this stage in the novel and later on where Tony ends up in the jungle, the fact that he identifies one of the characters as like a monkey, we may choose to say create some connection between those two places. However, most significantly with the death of John Andrew, it is the end of the relationship between Brenda and Tony. Brenda acknowledges that the reason why she will now divorce him is because there is no longer any children in the relationship. If Tony had not led to the death of John Andrew, we may suggest that she would have burnt out with John Beaver much earlier. 
However, without the presence of John Andrew anymore to connect the two, very quickly Brenda moves away from Tony and moves back to London. In fact, when they have the discussion about having more children, Brenda quite clearly is distressed by the thought because she wants to get out of this cycle. I leave you with a video from T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. It is the opening book, The Burial of the Dead. The reason I leave you with this is the most significant line that appears right at the end is that Eliot will show you fear in a handful of dust. And I'd suggest that the death of John Andrew at this stage in War's novel is War showing Tony fear in the handful of dust. The Burial of the Dead April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. Winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow, feeding a little life with dried tubers. Summer has surprised us coming over the Steinbergersee. With a shower of rain we stopped in the colonnade and went on in sunlight into the Hofgarten and drank coffee and talked for an hour. In our country. And when we were children, staying at the Archduke's, my cousins, he took us out in a sleigh and I was frightened. He said, Marie! Marie! Hold on tight! And down we went! In the mountains there you feel free. I read much of the night and go south in the winter. What are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images where the sun beats, and the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, and the dry stone no sound of water. Only there is shadow under this red rock. Come in under the shadow of this red rock, and I will show you something different from either your shadow at morning striding behind you, or your shadow at evening rising to meet you. I will show you fear in a handful of dust. Frisch weht der Wind, der Heimat zu. Mein Irish Kind, wo weilest du? You gave me hyacinths first a year ago. They call me the hyacinth girl, yet when we came back late from the hyacinth garden, your arms full and your hair wet, I could not speak. And my eyes failed. I was neither living nor dead, and I knew nothing. Looking into the heart of light, <coughs> Madame Sosostris, famous clairvoyant, had a bad cold. Nevertheless, is known to be the wisest woman in Europe with a wicked pack of cards. Is your card the drowned Phoenician sailor? Those are pearls that were his eyes, look. Here is Belladonna, the lady of the rocks, the lady of situations. Here is the man with three staves, and here the wheel. And here is the one-eyed merchant, and this card, which is blank, is something he carries on his back, which I am forbidden to see. I do not find the hanged man. Fear death by water. I see crowds of people walking round in a ring. Thank you. If you see dear Mrs. Equitone, tell her I bring the horoscope myself. One must be so careful these days. Unreal. 
the city. Under the brown fog of a winter dawn, a crowd flowed over London Bridge. So many, I had not thought death had undone so many. Sighs, short and infrequent, were exhaled, and each man fixed his eyes before his feet. Flowed up the hill and down King William Street, to where St. Mary Woolnoth kept the hours with a dead sound on the final stroke of nine. There I saw one I knew, and stopped him, crying, Stetson, you who were with me in the ships at Mealy, that corpse you planted last year in your garden, has it begun to sprout? Will it bloom this year? Or has the sudden frost disturbed its bed? Oh, keep the dog far hence, that's friend to men, or with his nails he'll dig it up again. You hypocrite lecteur, mon semblable, mon frère. 